Anybody? Nobody? Man. <laughs> See, there we go. Um, so if you are feeling led by the Spirit to be water baptized or you know someone, and even if they don't come here, guys, for real, even if they don't come here, I'm putting that out there, um, and you have someone in your life that you are discipling or that you are walking with and wants to be water baptized, let them know. We would love to partner with them in that. Um, we do not have a specific Sunday picked yet, but when we hear from people that want to be water baptized, um, then we will get that set up. So we will let you know further details later. Um, we also have some changes coming up in September. So one of those is that Ben is going to be sharing, Pastor Ben is going to be sharing a message this morning um, along the lines of spiritual warfare. And as part of that, we are feeling led by the Lord to, to really dig into that and what that looks like. Um, so practically, we are going to launch in September, once a month, worship and prayer night, really specifically designed around an environment where we can push into prayer together. That may look differently depending on who's here, maybe just all together. It may be splitting into little groups. Um, but if you have your Wednesday night, second Wednesday of the month at 6.30 available, September through November, please consider coming here and joining us. We would love that. Also in September, um, we, we always have small groups going on. We've had seasons of small groups, as many of you have noted that have been here for a while. But in September, we're going to kind of relaunch our model of small groups where we have quarterly small groups. So that would mean September through November, we'll have small groups going. Um, and some that may want to continue, like our Ladies Friendship Circle likely and some others, um, it may continue. That is absolutely fine. But some groups may just launch for September through November. And then new groups launch January through March. And then new groups April through June. So if you are feeling um, led or have an idea of a small group you would like to see happen or that you would yourself like to lead, please let Pastor Ben or myself know so that we can kind of partner with you and um, figure out what next steps could be. Um, and then if you're wanting to join one, just keep your eyes and ears out for the small groups that will be available. Um, currently, we do have Ladies Friendship Circle led by Pastor Lori that meets once a month, various locations. They do different things. Um, we will be launching, um, Pastor Ben and I, um, our parenting group at our house once a month, 6.30 on the fourth Tuesday. Um, Eric Strom, still leading an amazing group on Tuesday nights. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then Johnny Landis um, will be re also going to honor some of our grads that we have to keep pushing off the dates, but due to some illnesses, um, we're going to push that off till next week um, and pray over our new grads. Um, one other thing is that you guys may have noted last week we had some glitches with our live platform for those of you online. Um, we were trying to switch to something that was a little more user-friendly um, and did not realize there was a time cutoff. So the live stream did get cut off last week. So this week we are bumped back to Facebook temporarily. But keep your eyes peeled. We are going to be launching in a couple weeks a brand new website and live platform um, that is going to be amazing. It is specifically designed for churches. It's called Subsplash. Um, and yeah, it's just going to be great. So, um, but... Before we jump into worship this morning, we do want to do one other thing, and that is pray over our teachers and students that are either launching back into school in the next week or two or already have. So if you are a student or teacher, if you just want to like raise your hand up real quick. See, there's a, quite a few in here, and I know we've got a couple back in our classes teaching here as well. So um, let's just spend a minute just to, to pray over them real quick. Lord, we just thank you for our teachers, Lord. We thank you, um, Lord, the way that you have gifted them and equipped them um, to minister to these kids in the schools of this area, Lord. Lord, that they are your hands and feet in these schools where, where some of us don't have that opportunity to be, Lord. Lord, that you would just give them insight into these kids' lives, God, that as they are there, that it that it wouldn't just be the teaching and the job, God, but that they would truly see it as a ministry that you have put before them, Lord, and that um, that you would just equip them, God. Lord, that I even believe, God, that you'd be giving them visions um, and words for these students um, that would just profoundly touch their lives. Um, students that are 
in just difficult home environments um, and such and need someone to care for them uh, in a way that maybe they don't see on a normal basis, God. And Lord, we just pray for the students as well, God, that they would also see their, their classes and their friends as um, a place, God, that, that they can be your hands and feet, God, that you can move through them, Jesus. Lord, that um, our students that are launching back into school the next couple weeks, God, that, that they would just grow exponentially in their walks with you this year, God, um, that you would be speaking to them, God, um, and that, again, that they would just be your hands and feet, Lord, that you would give them the strength that they need from day to day, God, the endurance, the perseverance, Lord, um, and that they would just see all the things that you're doing in and through their lives, God. So we just give, um, give each of them to you, Lord. We give this morning to you. We give our worship to you this morning, Lord. Um, Lord, we just ask that you would just have, have your way in this place this morning, God. Amen. So as we jump into worship here in a second, um, we know that we can worship in many ways. We can worship with our hands, jumping up and down, kneeling before the Lord, um, but we also worship with our tithes and offerings. So if you feel led this morning to, to give of your tithes and offering back to the Lord, um, feel free to do so in the boxes in the back, baskets in the front, website, or text a uh, cash number to 84321. Um, but... With further ado, we just want to jump in and just be in the presence of God this morning. So would you guys please stand? We will do such. Hey, how is everybody? You guys good? So um, I have to tell you, I wasn't planning on saying anything before worship, but I think about that verse, and it's we can make our plans, but God directs our paths, right? And so it's so funny um, the worship team, we practice on Tuesday nights, and we had a practice on Tuesday night, and we had everything done just how we wanted it, and the next day, uh, I get a text, and one of, well, Dave Corrigan, he's sick, and so there's some songs that were just dependent on Dave, so, well, we got to change out some songs, and then this morning, learned that his better half his better half <laughs> is uh, also sick, which we were depending quite heavily on, <laughs> Cindy. And so um, anyway, it's, it's like we can make our plans, <laughs> but God directs our paths. And so um, as we go into worship this morning, that's what I want to encourage us to do. You know, we expect worship to go a certain way, right? It's like we have fast songs and then a slow song or whatever. But what if God wants to say or do something different? And so we just want to really make room for the Lord today. We want to actually declare that together as a body, that we are making room for him. And so Jesus... We come before you. We tell you, Lord, that we're just a bunch of people who need a very, very big God and who love an amazing God. And so we just set aside this time for you. We say, Lord, have your will, have your way. Lord, we make a place for you told in the book of Isaiah that the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. And Lord, today, this is where we're offering you that place for you to just rest your presence, for you pre to host your presence here in this place. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you so much. Amen. Amen.
chains are gone, gone. Now my sin is dead and gone, and I sing hallelujah.
Just receive his love. Just let your heart be enwrapped, enraptured in his love. Overwhelm us with your love. The Bible tells us there's a verse that says, when my heart condemns me, that God is greater than my heart. I just feel like there's people here today, maybe online, that you've been beating yourself up all week. And you know what? God wants to meet with you. He wants to just come and be so close to you. He just wants you to know that he loves you. He loves you so, 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 so much. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Just receive it now. Just open your heart and receive it. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. He loves us. He loves us.
you've done, no matter what you do.
is the lamb that was slain to receive all power and riches and honor and glory and blessing be to him who sits on the throne stress from the weak take everything that weighs your heart down right now lay it at his feet make room for him <laughs> we make room for you whatever that looks like whatever that sounds like maybe it's just a cry let it go, let it go, let it go, and make a room for you. <laughs> so kind are you, God. You see it all. You see it all. <laughs> so I lay it all down. I lay it all. somebody here today or maybe you're online but you're so empty right now you're just feeling really drained you're just really feeling like boy I just given 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 nobody gives back you're feeling like you're responsible for the world. You feel responsible for everything. Jesus is here today to take those rocks off of your back in the name of Jesus. That you can just lay those things down, just all those things, all those burdens, all those worries, all those fears, all those things. You can just lay them down. You just take them to the cross. And you say, God, you are bigger than I. And God, all things are in your hands. Just do that now. Let it go, let it go, all those 
those things, all those things, all those worries and fears and doubts, lay it down. Let it go. Jesus, you are faithful to take my burdens, Jesus. You are exactly who you say you are.
to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you going to continue and just take a few moments here this morning. Um, when we say we want to make room for God in our life, we, we want that to be like the preaching of his scripture, the singing together of these songs, but also we want space where God can actually speak directly to us. Like we literally believe that God is alive. He's alive. He's real. He's here right now. The Bible is a book where God spoke to people from cover to cover. There's nowhere in there that says that he stopped speaking. Okay, so right here in this moment, I just, let's just respond to God. Let's just take a moment. Let's close our eyes. Let's forget about everyone else around us. For some of us in this moment, we just, we need to give our lives to Jesus. Maybe we haven't done that. Maybe we need to rededicate our life to Jesus. No one else is looking at this moment like, let's just declare our faith. Jesus, we believe. 
We believe that you are our king, that you are our savior. We believe that you lived as an example for us. We believe that you went to the cross to pay the price for our sins, for our forgiveness, for our wholeness. We believe that you were put in that grave. Oh, but you didn't stay there. After three days, you rose again. You defeated death. Just as we now get to partake in eternal life with you. Lord, you ascended to the right hand of the Father where you poured out the Holy Spirit. And when we give our lives to you, your Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. And so we make a fresh declaration today, right here, right now, that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. That's what your word says, God. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You are no longer a slave to sin. You have temptations, but you don't have to give in to those temptations. So we thank you for that freedom that we have in you, Lord. God, and in this relationship, just as it looks like throughout the Bible, you speak to your people. And I believe that each person under the sound of my voice has something that they need to hear from you. I think it's different for each person, but you're a personal God. And so I'm going to ask right now, Father, would you speak? For some of us, maybe we haven't ever heard your voice. Help us to hear. Help us to recognize your speaking, whether it's through pictures or feelings or, or visions or, or hearing your voice internally, whatever that be, God. I'm just going to be quiet here for a moment, and I, I just ask you, help us to hear you. Help us to recognize your voice. Speak to us now, Lord. Now really listen in. God, what would you have for me in this moment? Speak, Lord. We're listening. And I want you to hold on to whatever it is that the Lord's speaking to you. I want you to remember it. I want you to write it down. I want you to recall the feeling of hearing the voices, Lord. I want you to normalize this in your life because this is what relationship with Jesus is all about. So Father God, we glorify you. Jesus, we do declare that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that you are already victorious over all else, that you are the undefeated God. We just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we get to experience that in our lives. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Would you give him a clap of praise? Well, I'm going to have Mr. Sam turn on the lights back there, and we're going to take just a moment, look across the room, see if there isn't someone you haven't ever met. Go say hello. Go give a holy high five. We'll be back with you in just a moment. All righty then. We're going to be in Psalm 59. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. 
I'll also have it up on screen. Um, and if you have your phone out, I'll just assume that you're reading the scriptures on your phone. <laughs> Makes me feel better. Psalm 59, starting in verse 1. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil. Save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me and see. You, Lord God of hosts, are the God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Selah. Each evening they come back howling like dogs, prowling about the city. There they are bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips, for who they think will hear us. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. O my strength, I will watch for you. For you, O God, are my fortress. My God, in his steadfast love, will meet me. I love that. He will meet me. We need to say that together. He will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Kill them not, lest people forget. Make them totter by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. Father God, we do just declare here in this house that this is your word. God, that your word is our source of truth. Lord, you've given it to us that we would live our lives by it, that we would understand how to live righteously, how to live before you. God, how to be a light to the world around us, how to live in the strength that you've called us to live in and the might and the power that you've called us to live in. And so teach us this morning, God, each one of us. Help us to learn, help us to grow, help us to look more and more like Jesus. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Well, we are in a series entitled Lines to Live By, where we're going through a number of psalms, which are songs, and the songs that we've chosen to go through are ones that correlate with David's life and things going on in King David's life. And at this point in David's life, he's been anointed as the king of Israel, but he's not living in that promise of God quite yet in his, in his life. And in fact, in this moment, King Saul is the king, and he is trying to kill King David. Now, this message has a dual purpose. Obviously, it's a part of our series, Lines to Live By, but I think there's a deeper purpose and a deeper meaning in this, this message. I think God is asking me to share this message to set a tone with us for this season at Rise, to set a tone for our church in terms of entering into, being aware of the need for spiritual warfare, and entering into spiritual warfare. Now, this is probably one of those messages where I'll do a little bit now, and then we'll do a little bit in a couple weeks, maybe a few weeks, maybe months, I'm not quite sure. I would envision us doing a more in-depth series on this at some point, but we'll see where the Lord takes us. I know this is what is supposed to be for, for today. Now, the first question as we read this text, though, the first question that I have is, why is King Saul so mad, bro? Right? What is the deal? Time and time again throughout this story, we see King Saul and David like getting along. Everything's all gravy. And then a switch flips, and he's like throwing javelins at his head. Like, I don't know if you have kids. I, I've got kids, and they, it feels like they throw javelins at my head. But like, right, put yourself in this position. This is crazy. Why is he so mad, bro? Well, the answer to this question is in verse, verse 2, where it says, David says, deliver me from those who who are evil, evil. It's this Hebrew word, ra, in the original language, ra. 
And it means, it means evil. It means motivated by an evil spirit. Right? So this evil spirit is tormenting Saul. And so in essence, what David is doing in this moment as he's giving, writing down this song is that he's entering into spiritual warfare. He's engaging with it. He's understanding that there's something deeper going on here than just what I'm seeing. Do you guys ever feel that way in life? Like things are going crazy. There's something deeper going on here. Right? And so here's, here's my question. As we go through this series, Lines to Live By, the hope and the goal was that God is going to be exposing some things in our life in our relationship with Jesus that might be lacking, right? That we're seeing as a part of David's life and his relationship with God that maybe we don't have. And so the question this morning is, is spiritual warfare a part of your relationship with Jesus? And I really want us just to genuinely sit before God with that one. Because this is we see as this is an example that we see in Scripture. Now as we momentarily shift our focus in the idea of spiritual warfare, I want to say that I have been spiritually triggered in this day and age. I've been alarmed by comments that I've been hearing and seeing, especially that that Christians have grabbed a hold of. And it makes me believe that what we're experiencing is actually something called syncretism. Have you guys heard that before? Syncretism. Say it with me. Syncretism. You said it good. You said it good. Syncretism. Syncretism is the blending of beliefs. It's the blending of cultures. It's the blending of religions. It's basically the way that within our society today, we look around us and we view religion and life as a fast food line where we say, I want mayo, hold the lettuce. And that's what it's like when it comes to Christianity. Like, I want this part of Jesus, eh, but I like what Buddha's saying over here. I like what culture is doing over here. And I'm going to just join this and I'm going to call this Christianity. Now, I don't want you to be too alarmed feeling like you're the only one who's ever experienced something like this. This is something that has happened to the people of God for a very, very long time, right? They always start off in this place, yes, God, we will live for you fully, God alone. And then it becomes God plus the idols of this world. God with the big G along with all of the gods with the small Gs. God, the real God, with things from this culture, with influences of people, people around me. You see this throughout the Old Testament. You see this throughout the New Testament. You see this in our lives today. Now, the enemy, Satan, has a kingdom, and his kingdom is included in this world, right? He's the prince of the world. He operates in what's called the kingdom of darkness, you guys know why it's called the kingdom of darkness? Well, multiple reasons. One of the reasons being in the dark, you can't really see what's going on, right? In the dark, things can be done without it easily being noticed, easily being recognized. It's hard to see. But I feel like the Lord has charged me this morning with helping each of us to see just a little more. He's charged me with shedding some light on some of the ways that the enemy is functioning. Because sometimes we just look around our world and we're like, oh yeah, this is happening, this is happening, this is just life. Where if sometimes if we had our eyes opened and we recognized how the enemy works, how Satan and his demons like to work, we could say, no, that's the work of the enemy and I've got power over the enemy because he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. So I'm going to stand on that, and I'm going to say, you have to stop now. Now imagine if we lived this life on a normal basis, where we walked around our normal lives, and we recognized, oh, the enemy's working here. You're done. The enemy's working here. You're done, right? So I'm going to say, you're done. It's just fun. You're done. We got to get, get good at this. 
In the spiritual sense, you're done, Satan. Whenever today is called today, we can say, not today, Satan. Right? Not today, not today. Now, the Bible says that we are sojourners here on earth, right? We're sojourners here because we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Philippians 3.20, 1 Peter 2.11. But Satan is the prince of this world for the time being. Following him are a third of the angels that got cast out of heaven. We now call them demons. And so he's got this whole rank of demons that are doing his bidding. And his influence is all around us. Another way to understand this, every human, each one of us, functions according to one or more of these influences. So when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about our thoughts, our actions, our words, our lives are influenced by one of three things. By the flesh, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, or by demons, by Satan. This is how we function. And as we talk about like the role of the enemy's life, or the role of the enemy in our life, rather, um, we can see that humans can be influenced in a few ways. They can have demonic, in, uh, demonic tendencies, right? So every now and again, we do things that are just evil and just sinful. And this is like a habit that we have, and it just happens in our life, and it comes up. Season in, season out, it just happens, right? We have demonic tendencies. Humans can also be demonically oppressed. You know, Christians can be demonically oppressed, Jesus himself was attacked by, by demons, by Satan, tempted, right? We see, we're gonna see in the story of Elijah where he was oppressed by demons. And so they can definitely have an impact on, on our life. And then humans can be possessed. That means to be controlled, right? Christians can't because we belong to Jesus. But humans can be possessed and again this works like a sliding scale often like we have tendencies right most of us will have some sort of tendency evil tendencies and what happens is when we spend time with Jesus the Holy Spirit will bring conviction into our lives right he'll say hey you probably shouldn't be doing that you probably shouldn't live this way you should probably do this but instead of following the promptings of the Holy Spirit, we choose to live our own way. We choose to give in to those tendencies. And when that happens, what it does is it opens a doorway for the enemy to come into our life, to have more influence in our life. And all of a sudden, these tendencies now move towards more oppression, more and more. And once again, as we're being oppressed, we're calling out to God. He, he shows us how to shut those doors but we're like, yeah, that seems like a lot of work, right? And eventually that can give way towards possession, another doorway for the enemy to, to get in. Think of it like, like this, the way that the enemy is influencing us in, in society. We live in this world, and it's, it's like throwing a frog into boiling water, right? If you throw it into boiling water, it's gonna jump out right away, right? And so if the enemy is like just trying to get us to jump into a full-on, crazy, sinful life, we're just going to jump right out, right? So instead, he turns the heat up little by little in, in little ways so that we won't get alarmed. But I want to sound the alarm this morning. I want to sound the alarm. It's in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six, 36, where they're asking Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? You guys remember this? says, love the Lord your God and love people. So love God, love people. And you have to remember that whatever God creates, Satan likes to counterfeit, okay? He likes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and so he'll counterfeit all these things that God is making and creating in order to steal, kill, and destroy your soul. Did you know that Satan knows the Bible? Satan knows the Bible, in fact, the Bible is probably Satan's best play. 
It's probably his best play against, against us. We see him use it time and time again with Jesus when he's being tempted. The thing is, is that he twists it just a little bit. He doesn't completely contradict it, but he takes it and just twists it just a little bit. So check this out. God tells his people, love God, love people. Say it with me. Love God, love people. Satan's like, I love this. I love this. Love God, love people. Yeah. Let me ask you this. In our society, in our culture today, do you see a a war on the idea of love? We see this war going on. Love is love, man. Love is love. Love is what you believe it to be. Whatever you make of it is is what love is, is what people will say. That means love is self-defined. I make the definition, which makes me God. Or we hear, love is total acceptance. Or love is never telling people that they are wrong. Love is never calling out a sin. Love is being best friends with everybody. Because we're not in gangs, right? Love is advocating for things even though they're being done in unbiblical ways because they're doing amazing things. They're doing signs, they're doing wonders, they're doing things that seem like it could be of the kingdom of God. Let me remind you this. Matthew 7, 22 says that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. What's this saying? This is saying that there are people in the world today who are doing things that look like they are powerful, mighty, look like they're in the name of Jesus, look like doing signs, wonders, miracles, but they're not. It's the work of the enemy. Well-meaning Christians are being demonically influenced by this propaganda and they're just eating it up. This is awesome. This is great. I love this. Let's address some of this. Like, Just take everything I just said and I want you to consider these scriptures as I read them. 2 Corinthians 6.14 where the Bible, or where culture would say, in order to love God and to love people, We must be accepting of everybody. We must be tolerant of everybody. We must be welcoming of everybody. We must be best friends with everybody. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Let's keep going. 1 Corinthians 5, 11. But now I am writing you not to associate with anybody who claims to be a brother but is living immorally or is greedy or is an idolater or is verbally abusive or a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. That doesn't sound like culture today, does it? 2 Timothy 3.5, but I understand this, in the last days, terrible times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, without love of good, traitorous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, that means it looks like they are living godly, but denying its power. What are we supposed to do with them? It says, turn away from such as these. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Therefore come out from among them and, ooh, this is scandalous. Be separate, the scripture says. Be separate. Let me do one more. Proverbs twenty two twenty four. Do not make friends with an angry man. Do not associate with a hot-tempered man or you may learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. 
So it seems to me that the way that the enemy is defining love, it's creeping into our Christianity. It's creeping into our understanding of what biblical love is. Ephesians 4.14 says, so that you may no longer be children. Anybody want to mature in Jesus? Come on, I want to mature in Jesus. So that you will no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitfulness. Rather, speaking the truth in love. And so non-demonic love, the love that Jesus stands for is a love that's rooted in truth. And the truth is the word of God. There's a lot of other things that claim to be truth, but the truth is the word of God. This is not a popular message today, but non-demonic, Christocentric love will cause you at times to put distance between you and some people. That's all of the scriptures that I just read. Matthew 10, 34 says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. And I'm like, hold on. Okay, let's get into this a little bit. Like, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is saying this. And Jesus is who? He's the Prince of Peace. Right, and so naturally, and this is again how culture will speak, naturally what love looks like is being at peace with everybody, right? We're best friends with everybody. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth. How could this be? It's because Jesus is the lion and the lamb. It's because he's the beginning and the end. Right, he has multi-roles, And so when he came, he says, I didn't come to bring peace to earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father and daughter against mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. He's not speaking from a place of this is my desire. He's saying this is gonna happen because you will be forced in this life to draw some lines in the sand and say, I can't go there anymore. I can't live like that anymore. I've got some, some boundaries, right? Non-demonic, Christocentric love will cause you to put boundaries between people in this world. There'll be boundaries that you put in place that will help you to be in the world, but not of the world. To be reaching the world around you, but not be so impacted by it that it leaches into your Christianity. So if this is true, right, if there are times to create distance between you and somebody else because of the Spirit's outwork within them, what are some pieces of biblical wisdom that can help us figure this out, right? Because that's probably pretty important. Here's the cool thing. The enemy is not super creative, right? Satan's not super creative. He's cunning, don't get me wrong. He's crafty, he's not creative, And the Bible shows us ways that the enemy functions through different people, but he continues to function in the same way often. He does it over and over and over again. And there's a pattern over the past several years that in truly monumental seasons in my life and in my walk with Jesus, he keeps pointing me towards the story of Elijah. And so I just want to spend some some time. I want to spend the remainder of our time together here this morning just giving a brief overview of the story and the characters and then uh, get into some ways that we can identify the enemy a little bit in our lives. So we're going to start in 1 Kings 16, verses 29 through 33. It says, In the 38th year of King Asa, you've got to say it with a little umph, Asa, Asa, the king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. Okay, so he's the king. Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. There's that word raw again, motivated by evil spirits. He did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. That's pretty bad. 
because there were some pretty wretched kings in Israel. Verse 31, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, which means unhusbanded, and which means a worshiper of Baal, a false god, took for himself Jezebel, the daughter of Eth Baal, which is with Baal, with this false god, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab made, excuse me, an Asherah, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. So he's, he's pretty bad, right? He's supposed to be leading the people of God into victory. He's supposed to be leading the people of God into worshiping God. Instead, they're worshiping all of these foreign, foreign idols. Baal and Asherah were these foreign gods who were believed to have control over fertility and over weather, and it was said and believed that when they mated, that's what would bring rain in the crops, and so this is how they, they worshipped. First Kings 17, so we've been introduced so far to Ahab and Jezebel. Here's our third character. Now, Elijah, I wish I had some like music, bum, 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 Elijah, right? So now Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishbe. You guys know where Tishbe is? Me neither. Nobody does. It's such a small, insignificant place. We have no idea where it's from. And I love that because God can use someone from such a small, insignificant place to do such powerful things. He's from Tishbe in Gilead. And he says to Ahab, he goes to the king and says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall neither be dew nor rain except by my word. And so here we are on the very surface of this. We're like, all right, these guys got some beef. Like this guy just came out of nowhere and now he's picking fights with the king. But on a more spiritual level, we have Ahab and Jezebel leading the people of Israel into the worship of these foreign false gods, right? They're still worshiping the real God a little bit, but now this is added on, right? And now Elijah's like, it's not gonna rain or do at all. Like, it ain't gonna do nothing for you there, bruh. Like, nothing, okay? And so he's basically saying here, like, I recognize that your gods are the gods of the weather, but my God is God over your gods, right? My God is God over your gods. And so there's three years to demonstrate this, three years of, of no rain. And 1 Kings 18 says, uh, verse one, says, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. And so this is when we get to that epic showdown, right? In, in 1 Kings, what is it, 18, 19, somewhere, somewhere in there. And Jezebel hires 850 false prophets of these other gods. And they are tasked with making an altar and calling fire down. And so these, they're like, whatever, you know, going, going crazy. They're doing dances and all these, they're, they're cutting themselves. They're doing like all of this stuff and it's not working. Elijah is like, all right, my turn, guys. My turn. Y'all ready for this? Y'all ready for this? Right? So we're all, all getting ready and he's like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I don't want to do it just yet. I want you to go get a whole bunch of water and I want you to dump it all over, Right? No, 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 don't just do that once. Do it again, do it again. All right, I want it soaked. I want it thoroughly saturated. I was, never mind. I, w I was gonna say the word moist just to throw people off, but. <laughs> thoroughly soaked. And he prays to God and fire comes down and consumes the whole thing. It's powerful and it says in verse 39, that when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Let no one escape. And they seized them. Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. So God proves, again, 
that he is the God. He is the real God. And he brings back the rain. You're really wondering who makes it rain. God. God makes it rain, right? God, God proves to be God again. How do you think this went with Jezebel and Ahab? Good? Bad? How'd it go? 1 Kings 19, verse 1 says, Ahab t- tells Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and now he had killed all the prophets, how he had killed all the prophets by sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And Elijah was afraid. And Elijah ran off. Again, this is one of those things like you gotta think about this story. Elijah having this powerful, mighty moment of God showing up, doing the miraculous, and then slaying all the bad guys. And then this little lady says something. Like, I'm going to kill you, and, sh- and he runs. There has to be something more going on. Right? There's, there's demonic things at work within this. 1 Kings 19.4 says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. This is Elijah. He came down and sat under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die. That's intense, y'all. He said, It's enough now. Take my life Away, and we see the Lord refresh and revive Elijah as he's always faithful to do. As some time passes, we get to 1 Kings 21. There's this character named Naboth. Naboth has this awesome vineyard that's right next to the king's palace, King Ahab's palace. King Ahab looks over and is like, I want that. I want that. So he goes and talks to Naboth. Naboth is like, no, can't have it. And what's King Ahab do? (laughs) <laughs> he goes home whines cries my bible says that he was vexed right and his wife jezebel then steps in begins to take con- she makes up these lies about this man and has him killed now a little bit later ahab dies and through a series of events a man named Jehu is anointed as king over Israel. And watch what takes place in 2 Kings 9, verse 30. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. She painted up her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. She's like, Jehu. <laughs> you have to say it like that. Like in my Bible, that's how it's like, Jehu. And as Jehu entered the gate. She said, is it peace, you Zimri, murderer of my master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, who's on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him and he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood splattered on the wall and the horses and they trampled on her. Tell me the Bible's not like action packed. (laughs) Tell me the Bible's boring. You shut your mouth. Man. Okay, now you may be saying, PB, listen, these are people from such a long time ago. How in the world is this going to be beneficial to me today as we're trying to learn about spiritual warfare? Right? Revelation 2.20 says this. Jesus speaking through John as he's writing this down. He's writing to the church at Thyatira. He says, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality, to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent because of her sexual immorality. So this is a thousand years after that. So either this lady has a whole bunch of candles on her birthday cake or there's something else going on here. Paul would make sense of this where he would say in Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, of this world, against spiritual wickedness. And so what we begin to understand is that there's a spirit at work within Jezebel, a spirit that was at work within her then, a spirit that was with, in, in working within the lady there in uh, Revelation, and a spirit that's still alive today and at work. We recognize that there's a spirit at work 
in, in Elijah as well, right? Who was that spirit that was uh, working in Elijah? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, okay? There's the Holy Spirit, and he's still at work in, in our lives today, right? And then there was a spirit at work in Ahab. 1 Kings 21, 25 says that Ahab sold himself, right? And so there was a spirit, and these two spirits like to work together. They like to work in tandem. The Ahab spirit is one that's passive and just kind of gets ran over all the time. And the Jezebel one is super controlling. So what I want to do here with our last few minutes is just from this story, I want to call out a few traits of Jezebel. Traits of this spirit that will help us to be able to identify. And when we identify, then we can step into our power and authority that's given to us through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. So the first thing we recognize is that this spirit that works within Jezebel is seductive, right? Revelation 2 says she's seducing my servants. When Jehu was there, right, she put on the the makeup. She put on this stuff to make herself all prettied up, hoping to get him in bed. That is the situation. Now, as an outsider moving here to southeast Idaho from another part of the country, one of the things that I recognize about this part of the country is that there is a lot of seduction. One of the things that just has thrown me off was it seems like every couple weeks there's like reports of like child porn and, and, and all of these people like getting caught. I'm like what in the world? What is going on? Right, so this is one of the ways that we can identify the Jezebel spirit. Jezebel also hates authority, right? She hates Elijah, She kills a whole bunch of prophets. She murders Naboth, all because they all had authority. She's great, as we're looking to identify them, right? She's she's great when you're saying yes, right? But when you go to exert your own authority, when your opinion differs from hers, she hates you. She hates you. That's why it's always so alarming when I see someone leave a spiritual covering like a church and then go out and do their own thing without any accountability, without any spiritual covering. I think that's very, very dangerous. Right? Just because they're doing mighty things doesn't mean they're doing it of Jesus. Right? So Jezebel hates, hates authority. Jezebel hates to lose. I, I think m- many of us could probably feel this one, right? Like, I hate losing. She hates to lose. You see that on, on Mount, Mount Carmel. When she loses, she just gets irate in real practical sense. She gets irate. She leaves the church. She tries to destroy what God is doing and what God is building. She, she is so upset that she lost. She holds this grudge. We also see that she is, again, all about control. She likes to control governance and influence. You see her in the place of control as the queen, right? You see herself in, uh, in Revelation 2 calling herself the prophetess. She loves to be super spiritual. She loves to be in places of influence. She loves to buddy up to pastors. She loves to try and become a pastor. She g- gets on financial councils and on leadership teams and, and all of these things, but she always stands out because she's so controlling, even when it's not hers to control. And she gets irate when you take that control from her. She loves to control the information. You guys remember this story with Nabal, right, in the the vineyard. What does she do? She steps in. She takes control of the narrative. She's going to be the first one to tell the story. She's going to be the first one to go run her mouth. She's going to be the first one to tell this everywhere behind closed doors. Right, these are the ones that are often mistaken for just being like immature, running their mouths, but it's not immaturity, it's demonic. Because they're losing control of the situation if they don't tell their story. You guys tracking with me? She loves to control her image. These types of people have a whole bunch of different masks that they wear. 
We talked about this a little bit last week and the importance of being an integrous person, of uh, uh, being a Christian who lives in integrity. That means I am one whole number. I am one whole me. It's not me, the Sunday me, and then I've got my work me, and then I've got my behind closed doors me, right? All of these different me's. It's called to be one, right? But Jezebel likes to wear all of these different masks. We see her in the story putting on a, a fresh one with Jehu. So you begin to realize that this person has many, many versions, right? They've got that one that you see on Sunday on a normal basis, but then you meet with them outside of that, and they're someone completely different. They're cussing up a storm. They're, right, they're, they're very angry. They're flying off, flying off the handlebars. They're going crazy. They love to wear masks because it's a version of controlling their persona, and it's a version of controlling how people see them. You'll notice just a couple more here. She hates repentance. How many times does Jezebel repent in the storyline? Zero. Zero. Right? So she hates to repent. She loves to control your energy. She loves to control your energy. So they make up stories in order to control your energy. They make up stories that this, these type of people have all of the drama all around them, right? They're always stirring up drama. They're always stirring up these, these stories because it's a way to control your energy. Last thing that will help us identify this, this spirit is Jezebel loves death. Loves death. You recognize what Elijah was feeling when he ran. He got to this point of feeling so suicidal. It's another thing I recognize about this region is the numbers of suicide here. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's a work of a spirit behind that. So what do we do with this, guys? Like, oh, that was, that was really deep, super encouraging. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> so, so uplifting. Um, what do we do? Well, like we ended last week in the message, I want to cause us to just say, search me, God. Do I have any of these tendencies? Do I have any of these ways in my life? Jesus says that before we would call out a plank in or a speck in my brother's eye, I've got to remove the plank from my own eye. And so it has to start right here. God, search me. Before I go pointing fingers anywhere else at anybody else, I need, I need to be pure before you. So that's where I, I, I'd invite you. And secondly, again, I remind us that we battle not against flesh and blood. And so as we see this at work within people, we don't say, oh, you're an enemy, bye. Right? We begin to call out the spirit at work we begin to declare just the truth of scripture. He who is in me is greater than he who is in you, than he who is in the world. So the power of Jesus is stronger than that. And so I bind you up in the name of Jesus and I tell you to leave us alone, right? We begin this, this war path. We love the people. We hate the sin. We call the sinner to repentance. We love them, but sometimes that may cause us to limit exposure. So going back to where we jumped from with this psalm, is spiritual warfare a part of your relationship with God? It should be. Worship team, if you guys could come. 1 John 3, 8 says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. It's good news, right? Came to destroy the works of the devil. And as followers of Jesus, we have come to continue the ministry of Jesus. So we too have this commissioning to be aware of the spiritual war that is going on, really, in our lives, all around us. Now, I'm not saying we look for a demon under every rock, right? But I'm saying we become more aware. We say, God, okay, if this is real, Help me to see. Help me to see what is going on. And if there is anything evil going on in my midst, help me to be confident in you. Help me to be confident that I am a child of God. 
Help me to be confident in the power and the authority that I have in you. And then we go after it. Amen? Would you guys stand with me? Listen, I want to uh, just call us towards, towards action this morning. Again, where we would see anything in ourselves where we're like, oh, that is not of God and that was exposed this morning. We just want to say, all right, God, take this from me. And the Bible would say that when we remove something excuse me, from our lives that we invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill it. And so we want to ask God to search us, remove things from us, ask him to fill us afresh. And for some of us, this is like hitting home. You're like, this is right what, this is just what I needed. I needed to hear about this. I needed to feel like this, this push and this freedom to step into spiritual warfare And if that's you, we just want to be able to pray with you this morning. Just lay hands on you and and remind you of who you are in Jesus. Amen.